Supper Pod Show is produced and managed by podtalk.co.uk. I'm Mark Mason. And I'm Susanna Hornby. Episode 19, talking to Errol McKellar, MBE, football coach, mechanic and survivor of prostate cancer. Errol's here to tell us about his personal journey and how he is saving lives every day through the Errol McKellar Foundation. And a very warm welcome to Errol McKellar. Hello, Errol. Hello, good morning, Suzanne, and good morning to your wonderful team. As I balance here with the phone as we speak. <laughs> it's important to hear you clearly, Errol. Now, <laughs> yes. where do we start with someone like you who has done so much? Can you just take us right back to the beginning? Right, well, good morning, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. My name's Errol McKellar. I'm 63 years of age. I'm born in northwest London, Brent, and I'm a prostate cancer survivor. Um, you know, my life, that's where my life began in northwest London. Um, I was educated, went to school in Brent, moved on from there. And my life is pretty normal, really. I grew up, uh, my dreams was to be a professional footballer. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to trials with uh, Brentford. You know, I thought I did well enough, but at sort of 17, 18, they decided that I wasn't good enough or wasn't quite what they wanted, mm-hmm. which was difficult to take at the time because, you know, when you when you got a dream with no mm. plan B, that's what it was really. And then my dad said, son, this football thing's not working, so you're going to have to get a proper job. And I thought, okay, well, welcome to the real world then. And that's what I felt at the time. And, mm. you know, my dad put me in, you know, in touch with one of his friends who was running a garage. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started to become a qualified mechanic mm. through learning to fix and service cars. Then mm. you didn't uh, leave. Fo- you, sorry, you didn't leave football completely, though, did you? you? You coached because I didn't make it as a footballer. I, you know, I still had dreams that you know I was going to play football one day at some point in my life. So you know, I got involved with part-time coaching mm. as well as doing the work fixing cars as well. And, you know, so the journey doing that meant that I was very, very fortunate to have learned and understood the reasons why I didn't make it as a professional footballer and mm. tried to help those youngsters that were coming up in the system that wanted to become professional footballers. And and I think just helping them gave me probably more satisfaction right, than the disappointment of not making it as a footballer. Mm. You and know? you coached quite a few famous people. <laughs> Do you know what? Every every time I get asked this question, right, I, 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 have to, I have to start by saying that everybody that I've worked with, both male and female, are fantastic individuals and famous. But if we're get, you're going to pin me down on names, right? So Might have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very, very fortunate. Right, very, very fortunate to work with a young David Beckham from the age of eight to uh, 12, 13 mm-hmm. years of age. And I spent five years with him. Um, Hard working, very disciplined, mm-hmm. very proud to uh, have been associated with the work that he has done then and the work that he's done now. Mm-hmm. I worked with Sol Campbell as a youngster, mm-hmm. um, Ashley Cole, Ledley King. Jermaine Defoe, Lee Bowyer. Yeah, yeah, I've been very lucky, you know, mm. but it's not difficult when you're working with people that are very, very talented from such an early age. Mm. Because a coach, a good coach, all he's got to do is nurture that talent and, and, and enhance it and bring it out in that individual. And mm. I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Could you see it? Could you see that he was going to be an international footballer? Sol used to be a striker for me as a kid when I worked with him and he was always going to be a professional footballer. David Mm. Beckham was always going to be a professional footballer. Mm. Ledley King was definitely going to be a a professional footballer. And so was Ashley Cole. So Mm. certain ones, you you can see it, right? If if you're good at what you're doing, you can identify almost immediately from Mm. two, three coaching sessions, really. Sometimes you can probably spot it in one. Right. Working with good coaches enabled me to be a better coach and understand the game more, if Mm. that makes sense. Mm. Now, life was, I mean, I'm not going to say it was normal because that was quite a wonderful job working with those boys and and girls, I assume. Fantastic. Um, Yeah, yeah, fantastic. But what happened, Errol? Life was trickling along quite nicely. And then what happened? Yeah. To move the story on, you know, I mean, during my time, right, you know, I was still a mechanic and I moved on to sort of running my own business Mm -hmm. and I was still doing the part-time coaching as well. So, you know, I was enjoying life and then I got to 
the period in my life, right, where as a man, you've got to start sort of doing things that, well, considered to be very important. And, you know, my wonderful wife, Sharon, one of the things that she always complained about was that I was snoring in my sleep. And, uh, you know, and and this is a message to all men listening to this interview. Whenever a woman tells you something, listen, because... (laughs) You know, they are the greatest inspirational people this world has produced, right? We men are brilliant, (laughs) but we're a bit like that motor car, right? You know, we only do things when it breaks down. Mm. Whereas women, they check their oil, their water and their tires all the time. I went to the doctor because she was complaining so much. I said, well, you know, make an appointment with the doctor and I go. And listen, that's like, you know, me telling you to check your oily water and your tires Mm -hmm. because she made the appointment. I went to the doctor, sat in the reception room, picked up a leaflet from Prostate Cancer UK, read the leaflet. And I thought, you know what, while I'm here, let me make an appointment to come back and do this test. Mm. Went to the reception, sat down with the uh, lady at the reception and I said, I want to make an appointment to come back and do this test. She looked at me and she said, Mr. McKenna, you don't need to make an appointment. This is a simple blood test and it takes less than 10 minutes. Mm. Well, I've got to be honest, at that time, I never, ever dreamed that this blood test was, was going to change the rest of my life. Mm. I did the blood test. I even got home in the evening, while I'm, you know, and I sat down with the wife who was cooking dinner at the time. And I said, oh, by the way, while I was waiting to see the doctor about the snoring, mm-hmm. I did a simple prostate cancer. She immediately stopped cooking and she looked at me and she said, what's that got to do with your snoring? <laughs> Literally, yeah. but I've got to tell you, she turned to me and she said to me, you know what, right, only you could do this, right? You go to the doctor for one thing and then come out with something else. Mm-hmm. I did get my dinner that night, so <laughs> I was more relieved about that. A week after that, I get a phone call from my doctor. Could I come back and do another blood test? I said, yeah, I didn't think anything of it. I thought that they probably did the blood test and they just wanted to do another recheck because in my motor job, right, it's a conversation that I'd normally have with somebody, you know, like we'll just fix your car, drive it for a week and then pop back. Let's have a look at it. So I, that's how I took that conversation with mm-hmm. him. Went in, done the second blood test. I don't even remember right, having the conversation with the wife about the second blood test mm-hmm. until we got the phone call right, to go. Um, they called me to and said to me, could I, um, could I come in and do a scan? a biopsy you know I turned to the doctor and I said to him when do you want me to come in and do that he said well we've made the appointment for you to come in this morning Mm. so I said okay um no problem uh put the phone down and then I rang the wife and I said to her by the way um the doctor's called me Uh, I I think I forgot to tell you in the conversation before that I did a blood test a week earlier Mm. she said oh okay then um I said now they want me to come in to do a, a biopsy so she said, okay, well, she said, don't drive. She said, get a cab and I'll meet you at the hospital. So I said, okay. And as a typical man, before I put the phone down, I said to her, by the way, what's a biopsy? You know? <laughs> and she turned to me and she said to me, it's nothing for you to worry about. It's a simple test that you have to have, right? It's quite routine. Don't worry about it. I'll see you at the hospital. So that's how I took it. Mm. And when I got to the hospital, I was glad, as I say, that the wife explained to me about the biopsy in the way that she explained it to me. Because if she'd have gone into details, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'd have actually gone to the hospital to have it done. Mm. But luckily, I had it done um, because it's something that you have to have done Mm -hmm. right during the process of what goes on with prostate cancer. To move the story on, a week after having that biopsy, I then get a phone call because they wanted me to come in and and do a scan. Mm. So, um, you know, I went in, had the scan. One week after the scan, the doctor called me and my wife to come in to have a meeting with them. Mm. He sat me down and he said, Mr. McKellar, I'm afraid to have to tell you that your prostate is covered in cancer. I mean, now the story becomes quite serious now because I got up and I walked out of the room because I completely dismissed the whole conversation. Mm sat in my car and to this day I don't know whether I was scared frightened or both Mm. right I just burst into tears I was just uncontrollable you know I felt helpless I just wasn't sure what I was going to do next and I always refer to the inspiration 
of my wife and partners that are involved with people that are going through this battle because you know my wife came in she sat in the car with me and she and she turned to me and she said listen she said all the years that I've been with you I've never known you to quit on anything that you've ever done mm-hmm. so I immediately stopped crying and you know and I had to sort of take stock of myself really and and I kind of looked at her and I thought you know is she having a go at me or is this her way of motivating me to do something about it and mm-hmm. I took the latter that that's what she was doing she was motivated you know I turned to her and I said okay let's go back in and face the doctor then so we went back in I turned to the doctor I said doctor what do I need to do to deal with this problem and he said Mr. McKellar look if we don't remove your prostate you could be dead in six months so I said okay well let's do it then let's remove it and he said well there are some issues you're going to have to deal with Mm. there will be some um complications that you'll have to come to terms with I said to him if I've got a chance of staying alive then I'll take that Mm. you know we we removed the prostate Mm -hmm. Uh, there were still traces of cancer in my body, about 1.5% cancer left in my body because it had already started to travel right. outside of the perimeter walls, right? It had started to travel. So I had to have nearly three months of radiotherapy, you know, real radiation treatment mm-hmm. to get rid of the rest of the cancer. And that was difficult. That was very, very difficult and very brutal. But again, it was during a period right, where I was having to find myself and think about what to do next. And I, and I kept turning around to my wife. And I said, Shara, what do I have to do? Because I can't, you know, I think God has kept me alive for a reason, right? Because for the doctors to tell me that I've got this amount of cancer, mm. right? And uh, I didn't even know that I had this amount of cancer and I'm still here. Mm. I think that there has to be a reason or a calling. And, and she turned to me and, and like all women, all the inspirations that they give us, she turned to me and she said, you know what? This cancer only knocked you down. It didn't knock you out. And, you know, knowing you, you're going to go 12 rounds with this, but you're going to cheat. You're going to take everybody in the ring with you and you're going to come out beating this thing on point. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to go with that. I'm going to take that. I'm going to out work for six months. Right? And for those who don't know the story, I'm, as I said, I, you know, I'm a qualified mechanic. I had my own business and I you know, ran a garage doing servicing repairs and MOTs. Mm-hmm. When I went back to work for the first day, a guy walked into the garage and, you know, we got into p- sort of pleasant conversation. He said, oh, you know, heard what happened to you. Really glad that you're back at work and, you know, what you've gone through and everything else. And and I don't even know to this day why I said what I said to him. I turned to him and I looked at him and I said, have you ever had a prostate check? And the conversation went from being pleasant to him dropping his face and looking at me really stern. And he said to me, what the bleep, bleep, bleep has that got to do with my gearbox not working on my car? Mm. Right? Well, clearly it wasn't the kind of conversation that I think he was expecting. <laughs> no. So I turned to him with, in the next breath and I turned to him and I said, look, and this was without thinking about what came out of my mouth. And I said, I'll tell you what, I said, I'll give you 20% discount on the work I'm going to do on your car if you go and get your prostate checked. Well, luckily we didn't come to blows, right? And he left his car with me and he went his way merry way two weeks later when he came back to pick up his car he said oh i took your advice and he was waving a a bit of paper in his hand (laughs) and i looked up to the sky and i said jesus christ this has just cost me 200 quid he must have seen the look on my face because he said to me by the way don't worry about the money and up there again and i i said thank you god for that and and then he turned to me he said to me look he said but i think you need to read this letter well when i opened his letter and i read his letter yeah. He had 25% cancer in his prostate. And he turned to me and he, just, and he said to me, he said, listen, what I'd like you to do is donate that money to charity. But he said, listen, I think more importantly, he said, you need to start raising the awareness of this problem because I would never have gone to the doctor had you not have said it. This guy that came into my garage, right? he was the first of 48 guys that was diagnosed with prostate cancer, Mm. of which two are no longer here with us to tell the story. One was 42 years of age when he unfortunately came into the garage and found out that he had the the cancer. And he only lasted 10 months to the day that he he found out. The other gentleman was 36 years of age when he came in. Mm. And it's uncommon, but it's proof that younger men are suffering this issue. But what was sad about the 36-year-old for me is, you know, when he came into the garage, he looked ill. He looked like he was about to pass out. I turned to him because I was saying it to people every day. Mm. You know, I said, listen, have you ever thought about having your prostate check? What he said to me will stay and, and frighten and alarm me for the rest of my life. He turned to me and he said, no, I can't go through that. My two brothers have had prostate cancer issues. My dad has had it. 
my uncle has had it. And I thought, can you say that again? Because I just could not believe I was hearing this from this young man. And when he said it to me, I immediately took his car from him, put him in my vehicle and drove him mm. right to Homerton Hospital. Drove him to Homerton, because they knew I was doing this campaign, mm. right? They were brilliant, right? And I drove him to Homerton Hospital. He did the test there because they were doing the tests as people come in. Six months later, right, you know, when the conversation carried on during that period he came into the garage after he had the test done Mm. and as soon as I looked at him and he looked at me and he turned around to me he said to me it's too late it already traveled into my into my bones Mm. right six months he lasted you know Mm. but for me what was sad about that individual is that he died of ignorance Mm. he died of ignorance because the fact is he's Afro-Caribbean, right, mm-hmm. which is a high risk. He's got a history of it in his family, which is a high risk. And he chose to do nothing about it. Mm. The guy that was 42 years of age, for me, he was the unlucky one because he didn't know he had a problem until he came into the garage to be tested, mm. right, because he brought his car in to be tested. And I, of those three, was the lucky one because had it not been for my wife, I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you now. No. So that, that three scenarios of it. And what's sad about all of this is the stats are that 47,000 men a year are diagnosed with prostate cancer. 11,000 of those men will unfortunately die of prostate cancer. That means every 45 minutes, one man will die of prostate cancer. So that's over 129 men a day that will die of prostate cancer. One in eight men will die of prostate cancer. But more frighteningly, one in four Afro-Caribbean men will die of prostate cancer. Mm. And if it's in your family, it's even more critical Mm. that you get tested. And it's the one cancer that if you get tested early, you have a 98% success rate of being cured. Mm. You know, so it's a no brainer as to why men don't go and get it tested. The biggest battle that we find right, is men are dying through fear and ignorance. Mm. That's the biggest battle that we're finding at the moment. To them. Mm. So that's why the work is needed to get this message across. We have to get men talking. I mean, you know, I did a simple survey in my garage of of women that go to their doctors in one year. Mm. You know, I asked a hundred of the lady customers of mine, how many of you girls go to your doctor in a year? 89 out of a hundred ladies go to their doctors. I asked the same question to a hundred of my male customers and the answer was one. And he only went (laughs) to the doctor because he, you know, his wife refused to give him the the sweetnesses of life. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, so so what we're saying is men are like that vehicle that comes on the recovery truck when it's broken down. Mm. The women, when I was offering the 20% discount, women were coming in to get their oil, their water and their tires checked. Mm-hmm. But men came in very similar to that vehicle being on the back of the recovery truck. That's the time when they reacted, you know, and mm. we have to learn from our, from our ladies. We have to learn that we don't get a letter to go in and get yourself checked for prostate cancer. You have to get up and go and make it Mm. your annual MOT. That's what you've got to do. You've got to make it something that you say to yourself every year is on your bucket list of things to do. Yeah. 10 minutes it takes to get the check done. Why are we not responsible? We're getting better, but we're a long, long way Mm. from being anywhere near perfect. And like you say, it's a simple blood test to start with. There's no, no, nothing intrusive. No, I mean, you ladies have to go through far, far worse than what we men, Mm. you know. A lot of men jump to the conclusion that it's a biopsy. The first thing that you have to do is go in and get your PSA checked. Mm. Yeah, you know, your prostate Pacific antigen. That's what the blood test does, Right. right? It's designed to check that, what's going in and what's coming out of that area. So you started with your garage and the and your customers, but you've yes. spread your work much farther. Tell us about yeah. the Strong Knowing campaign for starters. Well, thanks to, to, to wonderful people like yourselves, Prostate Cancer UK, uh, and some ideas that we sat down around the table and, and, and put together, you know, mm. we felt, look, you know, a campaign needs to get out and reach the men and particularly those at higher risk, which is the Afro-Caribbean community. And Mm -hmm. Prostate Cancer UK felt that myself and a few other high profile people Mm -hmm. would be the ideal faces to get the campaign to where we've got it to now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my my philosophy with it is, right, although Afro-Caribbean men are at higher risk, right, 
the truth of the matter really is prostate cancer doesn't care about your colour and prostate cancer doesn't care about your wealth mm. and it certainly doesn't care about you. Prostate cancer does if you ignore it, it will kill you. And it's pretty hard hitting. I, yeah. So that's why the campaign was formed, right, to drive that message out, which I think prostate cancer will, would admit was very, very successful. Mm-hmm. And it has helped to continue the fight to get the message out even more mm-hmm. about what we have to do to raise the awareness. But you look at the situation now and, you know, we're now in a situation right where COVID is the big issue. And, and what, unfortunately, COVID has done is stopping people from going to their doctors and stopping people from going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we then sat down and felt, look, we have to find other ways now of getting this message out there because if the masses are not doing the things that you want them to do by going to the hospitals and doctors, Mm. then we have to go to the masses. Yeah, I know how hard you work now, Dana. I mean, you you work pretty much every day of your life now on... yes trying to inspire and motivate men to simply go and get a test. And you've worked with so many people as well, as you said earlier, people, high profile people like Colin Jackson and Linford Christie, just to name a few. But recently, and we're going to come on to your big award you've just won, but can you, (laughs) I mean, it's a, it's a big one. We won. We won. We've won, Susanna. You're part of that. You guys... You know what? Listen, let me tell you, right, I've been very fortunate to, as my wife said, right, this cancer, it did only knock me down. And because, you know, of the, you know, the inspiration that she has given me, my family, mm-hmm. but, you know, we'd be the first to admit the support that everybody has come on board mm. to help get this message across. Mm. We've been able, you know, the, the reasons was always to make a difference. And that's what we we hope that we've done. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, we couldn't do what we do. You know, they've given me this award, right, which you're going to talk about. <laughs> oh, yes. But, but, but the truth of it is, it's not me that they've given it to. They've given it to we. We, the people, are trying to make a difference. And, you know, in this journey, we have lost wonderful people to this mm. sad illness. And mm. unfortunately, it's something that can live inside you and you don't know about it because, mm. and that's why they call it a silent killer. Mm. What? You know? I mean, I'm going to get, yeah, that award conversation is coming, by the way. So brace yourself. Yeah. But what? No problem. <laughs> <laughs> but at what age do you have to start thinking, I must go and get a right. check? And this is this is a great, great question, right, that you're asking, right? Because, you know, the, the uh, official government lines are that at 50, they want you to go in and, and, and have a prostate check, mm. right? You don't get a letter for that, but that's what they would like you to do as part of your annual MOT, if you like, mm-hmm. right? If you've got it in your family, if it's a history in your family and you're of Afro-Caribbean descent, right, then they want you to go in at 45. But my issue with that is, is that I've actually been part of living proof of people suffering and dying a lot earlier than 45. Mm. So I'm saying, look, men, if it's in your family, if there's a history of it in your family, right, we should be setting a guideline of at least 30 years of age, Mm. right? Because this is an illness that if it's caught early and detected early, it's curable. Now, it makes sense, right, that if you're driving, and I have to put it in motor mechanical terms because that's what I'm qualified to do. If you're driving down the road and that red light on your motor car, that warning indicator comes up that there's something wrong, you're going to bring your vehicle into me as a mechanic to check it. Mm-hmm. And this is the question I ask all the doctors, I ask all the urologists, I ask them this question, And they've all come back with the same answer because I say to them, would you bring your car for me to check it? They said, yes. So I'm saying, well, the question I've asked you is the answer that you've given me, which is what I would do with something happening in my body. I'm bringing my body to you to check it, to tell me if it's okay for me to carry on. Mm. You know, my issue is you have to, you cannot wait until you're 40, 45 or 50 to have these checks done. Mm. Right, because it's clear that this is something that's that's happening to younger people, and more so because it's in the family. Mm. And and why it's frightening is, you know, I when I was diagnosed, I had the conversation with my dad, and I was alarmed. My dad turned to me and he said, "Son, I had this problem from five years ago," and and I was so upset with him. But since I started campaigning and traveling around the country, 
I realise this is so common mm. in our elderly generation not to have this conversation. You know, ladies talk, and this is why the campaign about talking is so important, mm. and not just for prostate, for every kind of illness, and particularly mental health, because everything relates to the seed of every issue, right, which is mental health, right? Mm. Because, you know, when you keep this concealed, right, you are suffering in silence, you know, and that's what we want to try and avoid. You know, we, you know our mission, right, I mean, I, I set up a charity, mm. right, called the Errol McKenna Foundation. And the reason why I set this charity up is not only is it a charity to highlight the issue of prostate cancer, but it's to get people to talk. Mm. We want to talk to as many men and their partners as possible, Mm. right, to ensure that they are fully aware of the dangers posed by prostate cancer and to recognise potential symptoms and know about the available tests that's out there Mm. because we want to stop men from dying through fear and ignorance. Mm. And that's the way, that's the reason why we set up the foundation because we felt that more needed to be done than what's already been doing. Mm. And, you know, not only uh, is it a benefit for me, but also what we learned, right, through from my, my wife's side of it is that this affects the people that are close to you. You're not, when you have prostate cancer, your partner is affected by it. Your family and your close friends are affected by it. Mm. So, the caring side of it is just as important mm-hmm. as the person who's going through the illness, mm. you know? So that's, you know, the reason why we set up the um, Errol McKenna foundation mm. to run alongside prostate cancer UK and other cancer research organizations, because sometimes people just need to be able to talk to one of their own, if mm. that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and I'm brutal when I say this, you know, if I talk to, to, to white men, I'm talking to them in a conversation. If I'm talking to Afro-Caribbean men, I'm telling them that they've got to go and get this test done. Mm. So, you know, there is two sides, but one answer to it. Yeah. You know, and sometimes you have to, it's like being a school teacher. You have to be a little bit sterner with some people than you are with others. And maybe I'm being, for, I'm fortunate that I'm able to be, to put this message across to either sets of people that are in front of me because mm. they need to hear it from someone who has gone through this experience. I mean, I still have to live with the difficulties of having my prostate removed. Every day is a challenge, right, for me as somebody who has had my prostate removed. So if I can prevent somebody from going through those battles and the issues as to why it's important to have early detection of prostate cancer, then that's what I will do. Mm. We need about a thousand copies of you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> do you know what do you know what listen i tell you what none of this could happen without the wonderful people like yourselves who give up their time to do interviews and talk to people like myself who are going through. because there are people that are talking mm. and you guys give us the platform to say what we have to say and look if we can save one life collectively a day right from this interview right then we've done something it's true now, we met you with, um, through Alan Forward from Stonham Barnes Park. Right. Well, there's a fantastic story, you know, and I'm, I can only tell you bits of it. Yeah. But, you know, I'm fascinated that Stonham Barnes has happily come on board with this campaign because, you know, it, it it's personal to the company itself. Mm-hmm. And it's something that they wanted to get involved in. And myself and, and Mr. Forward sat down and we had a conversation and they are campaigning and helping me to go out and raise more of the awareness and issues mm-hmm. and try to help to save as many more lives as we can. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, and with their help, got this new project that we're working on, right, which is called the mobile testing, yep. right, where, you know, we go back to this, the conversation we were talking about people not going to the hospitals or the doctors mm-hmm. and we want to roll this mobile testing unit out to the masses to get them to go and have their test because we're saying, look, you're not going to the doctor's um, hospital, so we're coming to you. Mm, brilliant. We're coming to you because, you know, and we feel that we will get the support and the backing from the government on it because yep. we're trying to organise it with 
lots of wonderful companies who want to get involved in it because we know we've pitched the idea to them and Mm -hmm. they are all for it and what they're saying is look people say they can't take time out of work to go and do the testing so if we're at your company right then the testing can be done on site yeah really no excuse you know yeah there's not you know and we've got wonderful people like yourselves who will promote and and broadcast this message Mm. out there about mobile testing so we think it's a forward plan and you know we're hoping that, you know, with the, you know, once we've completed the green light on it, then that's what we want to be rolling out next year. Yeah, fantastic. You know, I think we've come uh, to the moment, Errol, <laughs> <laughs> where yes. we are going to talk about that MBE. Do you know, I've got to say, but, uh, when when the phone came through about this honour, yep. one of the things that I said in my reply when I sent the details back, because it was the toughest thing to keep quiet. You know, my wife said the worst thing they could have done is, is tell you to keep that quiet. Because she said, by the time you'd already gone public with it, she said, it must have been the hardest thing for you to do and and it was it was mm. very difficult to keep quiet mm. but you know one of the things i said right <laughs> was it's not me that this honor is bestowed on it's all of us it's we who have got this because as far as they're concerned the campaign has helped to save nearly a million lives now one man you know this is not a movie that you see on the tv where somebody is in the middle of the shootout and he, he survives after a million people are around him Right. This is something that all of us have done. You know, me having this conversation with somebody, somebody having this conversation with somebody else. So for me, this honour is bestowed on all of us Mm. who have helped to save those lives. But unfortunately, on behalf of the people that we've lost in this journey, you know, that's why I want to dedicate it to Mm. all of those people. Uh, It's never me, it's we. It started with you, Errol. You have to take a bit of it. (laughs) Well, you know what? I, I take that bit. Yeah, I will. I take, I, 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 it's a hard one, but I'll take that bit. But I'm okay. proud to be someone who's made helped to make a change. Then I'll take that. I'm proud to be someone who's helped to make a change. And you know, and I go back to my wonderful wife, right? Because mm-hmm. as she said, she said I was going to take everybody in the ring with me, and I think that's what she meant. Really. Yeah. You know, she knew and you have you know, she knew yeah she knew you know I said to Sharon and I said you know what I said you know you brought this on me actually and she said yeah but it picked on the wrong person because as I said to you it knocked you down it didn't knock you out mm. you've taken everybody in the ring with you and you've helped to make a difference and if you've helped to make a difference take that bit of the glory then so I'm going to take that bit of it but it's still we you and everybody else, right, have been involved in helping this honour, right, to be bestowed. And can we save more lives with it? That's what we got to do. And that's what we're going to do. What, that's the important. Mm. Yeah, that's the importance of the uh, MBE for me, mm. right? You know, we want to make a difference. It's important that, you know, the Errol McKellar Foundation and the campaign to what we call MOT yourself makes a difference. And if we do that, then mm. the honour has, uh, has a meaning. It has a meaning, doesn't it, really? Mm. Well, I think everybody who's listening to this just need to tell another person and that person needs to tell another. And then it's the rule of, yes. I don't want to say the rule of six, that's a bit scary at the moment, but it's its the rule of six degrees. It's about it's the getting the message degrees. out. I love that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, what we, tell, what we tell people is your health is your wealth. And if you MOT yourself, that means your health is your wealth. Perfect. Yeah. And, you know, that's for me. Right, and thanks to, to Stone and Barnes, right, we are going to make a difference. That's what we want to do. We, on behalf of Stone and Barnes and the Earl McKellar Foundation, we are going to try to make a difference. And we can't do it without the help of yourselves and the public out there. So we mm. want them to come on board, mm. you know, and, 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 you know, we don't want them to just donate money. We want them to come with ideas, mm. you know, because how do we create these conversations? How do we make men realise that they're not on their own with this issue? Mm. You know, how do they, you know, because the biggest campaign at the moment, right, is about having a conversation and talking, mm. you know, We've got to get the government to give us a letter to say, look, you need to have your annual checks. Mm. You know, you can't drive your motor car without an MOT. You Mm -hmm. can't drive it without insurance. You can't drive it without tax. But, you know, I had nearly 100% cancer in my prostate. No one did anything or no one told me I needed to go and do something. Had it not been for something completely different, which is nine times out of 10, 
how people find out that they've got a prostate problem. They go to the doctor for something else. And then while they're doing that, they're having a check. So you've got to look at your body and say, you know what? I need to do an annual MOT on myself. Mm. Yeah, I know. I know. Just invest a little bit of love towards oneself now and again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Self-love. Nothing greater than self-love. You know, I mean, Mm. as I said to people, look, the idea of the foundation is to go into places where the likes of Prostate Cancer uh, UK and others have not gone into, not been able to go into for whatever reason, right? Mm. We're not going to be denied by the locked door, if you like, Mm. you know, We are going to get this message. We're going to have this conversation. We're going to say, guys, you're not on your own. You know what? Problem shared is a problem halved. Mm. And I think it's the greatest saying when it comes to something like this issue. It is. You know, we as men, we can talk about any subject under the sun apart from those personal areas. Mm. Errol, if we want to get involved, will you have a website? Yes, www.thererolmckellarfoundation.com. You Mm -hmm. can email your information. Mm-hmm. on temf2018 at gmail.com. Yep. We want people to come and, and sponsor what we're doing. We want people to come and support, but we want also their ideas of how we can get this message out there. We want to set up workshops, right, where people can once a month sit down and, and have this conversation. You know, same way we talk about everything else, let's include it in the conversation. Mm-hmm. It's not a subject that shouldn't be spoken about, you know, because... Sometimes your best friend has got this problem and he doesn't know how to have the conversation Mm. and he'd rather just suffer in silence. And we don't want that to happen. What we're saying is, look, talk to somebody about it. Ladies, learn from them. That's what we men need to do. Learn from these ladies. Women can have a conversation about anything. They're pretty open when it comes to to dealing with the issues. Mm. We're not opening with dealing with the issues. That's the problem, Mm. you know? So we let the issue become a problem. Ladies don't let the problem be an issue. They deal with the issue. Yeah, they do. Now, before you go... (laughs) Yeah. I know you're working very hard on, um, as you've just said, setting up the mobile testing units. Have you yeah. got any other events planned for next year? Or are you just going to wait to see what happens? Yeah, well, unfortunately, I mean, we, you know, we, we had a couple of quite big events planned this year, but due mm. to the, the circumstances before us, we've had to sort of suspend them. But yeah, next year we've, we would like to, one, have a concert another one do another charity football match mm-hmm. right where we get great celebrities that come out uh, and we mix them up with what we call sensible people mm-hmm. right because everyone <laughs> still everyone feels that they can still play for England or, or their respective countries mm-hmm. right so you know we give them that opportunity and, and and it's amazing how when you get a man standing next to Ben Shepherd right <laughs> uh, all of a sudden these 16 packs become six pack <laughs> yeah so you know we we, we, we listen we're we're very fortunate that, you know, the celebrities give up their time, mm. you know, because they feel passionate about this problem and want to support. Mm. You look at great, wonderful people like Rod Stewart, who we really, really supportive. Harry Redknapp really been supportive. Mm. And Sean Wallace from The Chase. Danny John Jules from Red Dwarf. You know, we, we're we very fortunate that these wonderful, wonderful people mm. give up their time to support the cause, right? Because you need both sides of the, the, the coin, really, to help you to do something, you know, mm. because it's as much celebrities as it is normal people. Mm. We're all the same. Yeah. You know, you know, you look at Mr. Bill Turnbull and wonderful, wonderful man and look at how he's dealing with the prostate issues and that's, that's your benchmark for what we've got to do. Mm. Thank you, Errol. Thank you very much. Ah, it's been no pleasure to you guys. To Honest, you know, <laughs> you guys have made it so easy. It's, you know, <laughs> thank you because, for, on behalf of all, you know, on behalf of the Errol McKellar Foundation, Stone and Barnes, and everybody that is involved in making a difference, we want to thank you guys because without you guys, the media masses, as we call it, you know, the message it only gets halfway. With you guys, it gets around the world, and and we're grateful to you for that. Bless you. Well, hats off to you, Errol, and to the great Sharon, and we hope to see you soon. (laughs) And, you know, I want to say a special thank you to Stone and Barnes and and Mr. Alan Forward, right, who, you know, he keeps himself in the background, but, you know, their fantastic team at Stone and Barnes is Mm. part of why we're going to make a massive difference. So please stay in touch with both of you know, the Errol McKellar Foundation and Ston and Barnes, because if it's going to happen, you're going to hear it first on this podcast. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, I could give you a big kiss. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for listening. And thank you to the wonderful listeners as well. Have a blessed Take care. day. All right, and you. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening to the Suffolk Pod Show. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or you can visit our website, podtalk.co.uk. And here's our disclaimer The Suffolk Pod Show will not be held responsible for any omissions or errors in its podcast. The Suffolk Pod Show is produced purely for entertainment purposes. Views and opinions are that of our own or that of our guests.